So can everyone can everyone hear me all right? It sounds like it. Um, so this talk it promises to be the good, the bad, and the lazy about eval, but there's also going to be some ugly in there too. So just um, bear that in mind. So just to start out, um, when I'm talking about laziness, what I really am actually really talking about is not so much laziness itself as evaluation strategies. And so broadly speaking, when you talk about an evaluation strategy, what you mean is sort of how is it that values are provided to functions and when does the sort of computation or sort of simplification occur, right? And so uh, Haskell, which we actually just saw, has um, like a call by need evaluation strategy. So um, expressions are not simplified or evaluated until uh, they're actually needed rather than when they're sort of passed into a function. Most languages we use, like Scala, for instance, but you know, JavaScript and anything else, are all uh, call by values. So expressions are evaluated immediately. And, and that's true of Scala with like a few sort of weird exceptions. Um, so I guess show of hands, how many people here have sort of like used laziness or sort of like use by name parameters or do things like this where they kind of mess with the evaluation of their programs? So a lot of people. Great. OK, so um, I'll sort of illustrate it, but maybe I'll go kind of quickly. So uh, let's say we've got this function called 3, and it prints 3. So the easiest way to illustrate this stuff is with side effects. Like, I know side effects aren't popular. But a weird thing about this talk is that we all love types, but actually evaluation strategy kind of doesn't occur. It's like kind of in the margins between types a little bit. So a lot of these issues, you can't speak about them in terms of the type system. So side effects are like an interesting way to illustrate it. Right, so if I have a function that says it needs an int and then returns a constant, uh, if I pass foo of three here, uh, you can see that it's printing three, right? Great. Um, and that's because Scala is a call by value language. Um, and so some of you have said that maybe you've done tricks like this where you've created these sort of things that get called by name parameters. Uh, and so in this case, when we pass it three, it doesn't print, right? Because in this case, it was a by name parameter. It's not evaluated in, until it's used, um, uh, which is great. And then similarly to that, you'll see that if we sort of add 3 to 3, we actually see 3 twice. So what's happening there is every time we, we talk about 3 and we need to get an integer value from it, we will run the computation, which in this case involves, includes a side effect to print 3 to the console. Uh, great. So. By name parameters are kind of like the weird loophole where Scala isn't always called by value, but it basically is um, always called by value. Uh, and certainly, in terms of value returns, when values are returned, they're always they, they're always sort of fully evaluated. So an int is is going to be an int. Um, this eval type that I'm speaking about is basically a way to avoid this. So uh, a lot of times, you know, both because we read Haskell programs and are envious of them, but also just because laziness is actually really useful in general, we would like to be able to write programs that have kind of other evaluation semantics. Uh, and so eval here is basically a type that does it. And so let me just import it really quickly. And I'm going to import some nice now, later, always defer. Great. So with eval, the most obvious way to use it is we can basically wrap values. And so this looks a lot like stuff you might be used to, like option or, or future or anything, where I can put three into this. And so uh, I could say something like 4 has the value 4. And in fact, if I do it like this, uh, I have an unclosed string literal, fantastic. Um, great, so you'll see that I define 4, and I immediately see the message 4. And when I go to add 4 to 4, oh, it apparently returned a string. Oh, I've had this problem before. This is annoying. Uh, I want this to be an int. Great. So now when I add them together, I get... Oh, my God. Oh, right, they're vowels, right, so I can't do that. So when I get... So critically, this is the very first point. So the great thing about eval is when you want the value, you call it value. Great. So you get eight. Awesome. I should remember my own talk. Okay, great. Fantastic. And so this... And so now sort of is like a val. You can think about now and val as having the same semantics. So if I say uh, val x equals you know, 99 and I put a print in here, uh, it prints immediately. Uh, I guess I, maybe I should print something so you can actually see what it did. So it prints something, right? And that's the same semantics as now. The value is immediately evaluated, stored, and then whenever you need it, you just get it right back. Um, but we have some other options here. So instead of now, we can do always. 
So always here, you see that we don't see the value, and that's because it's not actually available yet. Uh, Scala doesn't actually know what that's going to have yet. It hasn't happened. A little bit like the way of future, uh, without thread pools and all that stuff. Um, and so now, if I remember to call dot value, uh, you'll see that we produce the value 8, which is right, and you see that we evaluate it twice. So it's just like the byname parameter we saw before. Um, this actually ends up also being a lot like our earlier def example. So if we say that we have a def thing called 4, and we do it, the same thing happens. It, ha it gets printed twice. Um, the final one, maybe the most interesting flavor, is what's called later. And this is the thing that sort of works like Haskell. So I say, I've got 4, I'll give you the value later. Uh, we don't see any print message. It hasn't been evaluated yet. Nothing has happened. Uh, and then when I go to add 4 to 4, you see I only see 4 once. And that's the sort of interesting part is that it's called by need. So basically, it hasn't calculated 4 yet, but it will in the future when you need it, but it won't do it multiple times. Um, and there actually is an analog to this in the Scala world, right, which is lazy val. So if we have a lazy val that... Uh, yeah, 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 great. <laughs> lazy valve. Oh, I'm just, I don't know what I was doing there. Great, so it's a lazy value. You can see it says it's lazy. We don't know it. And then when we go to add z to z, we get 888. Great. So you might wonder, if we have byname parameters and we have lazy valves, like, why do we need eval, right? Like, it seems like we can already do this stuff with defs and lazy valves and valves. And the answer is that we sort of can, like, in a very limited case, but we actually, we don't have a very general mechanism there. So. Uh, for instance, as soon as I do this plus with, with a def or a lazy val or a val, I immediately have to sort of force it. It's kind of hard to compose these things, right? They're, they're sort of these like, you know, constructs that you can use in sort of one way, but they're not sort of very flexible. Whereas an eval, uh, that's just a type. We can do anything with it. We can return an eval. We can take an, e we can take an eval into a function. We can, we can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so... Now I'm going to kind of show you what sort of stuff we can do with eval. So first of all, we've been, um, we've been adding stuff directly, but we can actually add stuff lazily too, right? So we can, um, if we have two of these things, uh, we can generate a new one. And so I'm going to do this in a couple different ways so you can sort of see, kind of get a sense of what's going on. So this is one way that we could do this. We could just wrap, uh, wrap what I did, where I was calling value before, right? So we've got add. And we'll see if this will work. So we do it, and so you can see we now have an 8. But this kind of defeats the point, right? Like, we've already evaluated this. So uh, one key thing to note about eval, and I think it's a thing that's, like, important, it doesn't necessarily mean things are lazy. It's really just abstracting over eval any sort of evaluation strategy you might care to use. It doesn't mean it's not definitely lazy. It just might be lazy, or it might be a byname parameter or something. So in this case, it's not. this isn't really the definition we might want. Um, and we could do something like this. So we could say later. And this, this looks more promising, right? So nothing has happened yet. And then when I evaluate this, I get 8. Uh, and if we go back to the way that 4 is defined, oh, well, it looks like I screwed it up. Uh, we don't want a lazy val here. We want later int. Now if I go to do this, you'll see again that 4 gets cal called once, but not again. Um, but actually, there turns out there's a much better way to do this, and you really probably don't even want to use. We, we don't really want to call value in these cases. So actually, uh, it turns out we can map over eval like many things, right? So in this case, I'll use for syntax just because it's kind of nice. So get a out of x and b out of y, and we yield a plus b. Great. And so similarly to before, we've already evaluated for, so nothing happens. And then when we go to ask for it, we uh, get an 8. So basically, what, what's sort of happening here is that eval turns out to be a monad. And so in the same way that we can talk about, we can map, we can map over futures, and we can write sort of a chain of future calculations this way, we do it with eval too. And, and the nice thing is that mapping and flat mapping over eval is always going to be lazy. It's always going to defer the calculations. So in general, when you're working with this, you sort of want to be doing that. Um, now. I'll show you some kind of cool, some cool other things that eval can do. So, um, for example, uh, every people have almost everyone has seen this uh, kind of like naive uh, Fibonacci example where you you kind of recurse, right? I mean, this is a pretty standard thing. People have done this before. So great. So I can ask for the f and maybe actually I should make these big int because they get pretty big. Uh, Awesome. 
So now if I ask for the fib of like 10, I get 55. If I ask for 100, uh, like it takes a million years. <laughs> um, I was actually, wait, Fibonacci is actually maybe a bad one to choose here. So let me kill this. Let's go back in. What I really want to do is I'm going to try to create a stack overflow, and I forgot that Fibonacci is going to like take a million years long before it stack overflows. So uh, let me use a different example to illustrate that. So great. So um, let's just do something that's really dumb. Uh, really dumb stuff is, is nice. So this is just going to be literally, it's just going to take a parameter, and we're going to count to get that exact same parameter, uh, n minus 1. Uh, I've got a caps lock on or something. Great. So does anyone kind of know what the problem with writing recursive methods like this is? Have people run into issues doing this? Yeah? Exactly. You blow up your stack. So we can illustrate that really fast. Uh, great. So we blew up our stack, and I'm not going to go back, but basically what's happened is we've done this too many times. And so it turns out uh, with eval we can fix this. So if we say that we return an eval of int, we can fix it. So first I'm just going to do the dumbest thing possible, and it definitely isn't going to fix it, but um, we'll look at why, and then we can look at what the right thing to do is. So here we go. Oh, right, I, I restarted, so I have to import this stuff. Let's just import everything. I said everything. Great. Okay, right, and so the first problem is counter returns an eval, which is correct. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, so this is the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to take the value out of it, add one, and put it back into an eval. And that should work, right? Maybe. So, you know, if we pass 10, great, we get 10. If we pass 100, 1,000, 10,000, we still have the same problem. And so this is just the one, one gotcha that I really want to show you is that value, you shouldn't really be calling value most of the time. You should only call value on kind of like top level values because Eval has a lot of really sophisticated things like a trampoline and ways of kind of saving you from these sorts of problems, but you have to use it in a way that allows that to work. So instead of calling value, what we really want to do is we want to map over the counter, sort of like what I did before. So if we call map, we do this, and I totally blew it up. Why did I do that? Oh, right, and that's the other trick. It's not just this, but we need to actually defer this. And defer is what is going to save us. So 1,000. 10,000, 100,000. So let's try getting the value of this. And so it works. And so what's happening there is you might wonder, like, why, why doesn't map do it? And then the, so the answer is that we still have, a we still have a an unguarded recursive call. So this top-level counter, when we try to do it like this, you're still going to have an, a large number of recursions before you ever get an eval back. And the problem with the whole eval mechanism is that you want to basically be working with eval the whole time to, to guard your stack. And so Basically, when you, wrap, when you wrap an eval and defer, what you're sort of doing here is you're basically saying, I have something that's going to produce an eval, but I also want to start using eval now to protect it. It's, uh, it's sort of a way of like getting to the sort of call by need or other world a little bit sooner. So, so if you ever have concerns about laziness or this sort of thing, you just use defer and from that point on, you're going to be safe. Your, your stack is going to be safe. Your, sort of, your, your value will be lazy. Uh, and sort of operations will work correctly unless you defeat it by using value or things like that. So sort of the final thing I guess to leave you with is that like the analogy really is that the sort of three subtypes, now, later, and always, really correspond to vowels, lazy vowels, and defs, but they're, they're, you can use them at any point, not just when you're declaring a value, but when you're declaring a function parameter, a return type, anything, those types allow you to have those uh, evaluation semantics. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like lots of interesting places to use it. I had a, an example with fold right that seems like I ran out of time for to getting to, but uh, it really allows you to do pretty much anything you could do in a language like Haskell. Um, and it allows you to define lazy data types, infinite data types. You can partially evaluate. You can partially evaluate expressions. There's just a bunch of cool stuff you can do with this. So. Uh, but 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 if you use it correctly, if you if you just use now and dot value like I was doing earlier, uh, you're gonna not. It's not really gonna be lazy. You're gonna have problems, and uh, it's gonna be defeated. Mm -hmm.